All right, we're going to get going just to get through and we're going to push through until the end today. So we're going to go all the way from now until noon. I'm going to get through the end of the PowerPoint that we had. Cardial diseases and then I'm going to jump to respiratory physiology to get through a few respiratory physiology sections. And then I'm going to give us a preview of biochem that we're going to be working through. So we're not going to finish this today. This is just a preview of what's to come. Um, but we will be working on some biochemical pathways while we're doing endocrine and GI on Thursday and Friday this week. So we'll be doing endocrine system Thursday, GI Friday, and we'll be working in biochem to both of those days because one day for biochem is just too much for the brain. So we'll split it into two packets. Okay. But I want to get through this one just so we can finish up this section. So pericardial disease, we had gone through endocarditis and myocarditis, so I just want to finish up the trifecta with pericarditis. So pericarditis is inflammation of that pericardium. The keynote here would be sharp pain that's worse with inspiration, better with sitting up and leaning forward, and a friction rub. So those would be kind of your cardinal signs and symptoms that you could see on a test question. Complications could lead to pericardial effusion, so actually fluid within that pericardial space. <clears throat> and again, you can see here a little picture of pericarditis. If you want to remember etiologies, if mnemonics are your thing, then the mnemonic we have is scar in pericardium. So surgery, a connective tissue disorder, a cardiovascular event, autoimmune, radiation, renal failure, idiopathic, which is most common, Coxsackie virus, coming back again, and neoplasm. So the key ones I'd remember for etiologies of pericarditis, post-surgery, any cardiovascular events, idiopathic being your most common, and your Coxsackie virus. Those would probably be your most important etiologies. Big risk or complication would be pericardial effusion. And that's it. I just wanted to get through that little nugget. And then we're going to move over to pulmonary. We'll see. We might come back to the other two paths, but the presentations are up there. And it's all in the vascular conditions, which are pretty straightforward. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is the one. Great. So we're doing 1J, which is pulmonary pathology. So we've gotten through the cardio system. I kind of put pulmonary with cardio just because they are very much related. So we're again, it's not going to be a lot of your NPLEX exam, about 8%, but there are a few specific topics that the NPLEX likes to talk about, specifically ventilation and those lung volumes and how ventilation occurs and perfusion. So those are the two main areas we're going to focus on for our pulmonary physiology section. So what is ventilation? At its easiest, it's inhalation or inspiration, which is our process of breathing in air, and expiration, our process of breathing out air. Inspiration is active, expiration is passive. It's important to keep in mind. Expiration's passive, inspiration's active. So to inspire, we have to contract muscles. To exhale, we do not. Muscles just are relaxing, except for when under stress or duress right? Exercise states that we have tachypnea, a higher respiratory rate. When we include our extra muscles, then exhalation or expiration becomes an active process. But at baseline, at rest, expiration is passive. So lung volumes and capacities, there's four of each that we're going to talk about. So there is an activity. I did include a PDF online if you want to practice drawing out your lung volumes. This will help for those FBC, VC, TV, all those crazy acronyms that they include on the NPLEX. This activity will help you kind of remember what those mean and what they stand for. And we'll go through and kind of define them in this presentation, but I encourage you to practice at home drawing those out. So first are lung volumes. So tidal volume, I'm going to go here and get my pen. Tidal volume, is this volume located in between these two lines? 
This is the air that's moving into your lung with each quiet inspiration. So this would be normal breaths in and out, not requiring extra muscles or accessory muscle usage. So refer referenced as VT, tidal volume. Our residual volume is this amount here at the bottom, RV. It's the air that's in your lung after your maximal expiration. And this residual volume cannot be measured by spirometry. So anything that includes residual volume as a measurement cannot be measured at, by spirometry. That's where they often try to trick you because this residual volume is just the air that's left in the lung, much like your end systolic volume. It's the amount of blood that's left in the heart after a normal ejection. This is the amount of air that's left in your lung after a normal exhale or a maximal exhale actually. Our two other volumes that we should know about is inspiratory reserve up here and expiratory reserve down here. So IRV and ERV. Inspiratory reserve is air that can still be inhaled after normal inspiration. So when you're doing a deep belly breath, think about the tidal volume is your normal breath. And then your inspiratory reserve is what you do when you take that extra deep belly breath in that you're actively inhaling. Your expiratory reserve is after you breathe out your normal exhale, the extra amount of air that you can blow out is your expiratory reserve. Again, residual volume is what's left over after that expiratory reserve. So those are your four volumes that you'll need to know. Now they do capacities where they combine different lung volumes together to create these lung capacities, okay? So when we're talking about inspiratory capacity, it's all the things you can inhale. So it's going to include your resting tidal volume here and your re inspiratory reserve volume here. That's going to be your inspiratory capacity. Your normal resting tidal volume plus the extra amount that you can inhale. So it's the total amount of air that can be inhaled after a normal exhalation. So you breathe out normally. The total amount of air you can breathe in is your inspiratory capacity. Your functional residual capacity, you can see this down here, is going to be your expiratory reserve volume and your residual volume. It's the volume of gas in the lungs after a normal expiration. So after you breathe out your resting tidal volume, what's the normal amount of volume of air that's in your lungs after a typical breath, a typical passive exhale, okay? So this is a functional residual capacity. Given that it includes residual volume, you can't measure functional residual capacity with spirometry. You can guesstimate it because if you can get your expiratory reserve volume, you can then kind of guesstimate your functional residual capacity knowing how much residual volume is left in the average human, average person. That's how you can get a functional residual capacity or if you know your functional residual capacity, you can subtract your expiratory reserve volume and get your residual volume. So you can play with these numbers. Your vital capacity is probably the thing that's referred to the most common outside of resting tidal volume. Your vital capacity is the maximum volume of gas that can be expired after maximal inspiration. So you take a maximal inspiration and then you expire everything you can expire that includes all of the stuff, inspiratory reserve, resting tidal, expiratory reserve, except for residual volume. That's the only thing that's not included in vital capacity because residual volume stays in your lungs after a maximal exhale. Total lung capacity though is the total amount of volume of gas that can be present in your lungs. It includes residual volume. If you know these volumes, if you can remember this chart here, you will be set up for success many, many of your lung volume questions. So if you're going to put something, commit one thing to memory, this would be the thing I'd commit to memory. So there's two main types of ventilation. There's minute ventilation. This is the total number of gas entering the lungs or total volume of gas entering the lungs per minute. So VE equals your tidal volume times your respiratory rate. Your tidal volume is your typical breath in and out. It's about 500 milliliters. And your respiratory rate is how often you're breathing every minute. So your minute ventilation is tidal volume times respiratory rate. Then you have alveolar ventilation. 
This is the volume of gas that reaches your alveoli every minute. This is referred to as VA. It's your VT minus your VD, which is physiologic dead space. So again, VT, tidal volume, normal breath in and out. VD is physiologic dead space, which I'll show you what it is in a minute, times your respiratory rate. So what is this physiologic dead space? So we see here in our picture with my little, oh, here's our tracheobronchial tree. Minute ventilation is assessed from here. Breaths in and out, right? Normal breaths that we're taking in and out. Alveolar ventilation is assessed here in the alveoli. How much gas is actually reaching those alveoli every minute? We have anatomical dead space here and functional dead space here. These two things together are considered physiologic dead space because we're not taking into account these areas of, of where gas is getting. We just care about how much gas is getting to the alveoli. So we're taking the total vital tidal volume. Where's my pointer? Where did my pointer go? Crazy. Total tidal volume, what you're breathing in and out, you're subtracting the air or the gas that's left in all your other bronchial tubes, except for what reaches the alveoli, and then you're timesing that by respiratory rate. So it's just the gas in those alveoli. That's all this means by physiologic dead space. It's all the space that's not your alveoli, where gas is, where we don't care about that space when we're dealing with alveolar ventilation. Versus minute ventilation, we want to know how much air is getting in total every minute. Alveolar ventilation, only worried about how much air is getting those little alveoli every minute. So we can see here, anatomic dead space of conducting airways plus the alveolar or the functional dead space, approximately equivalent to anatomic dead space in a normal lung. So typically, all we're minusing in a normal lung is anatomical dead space, which is all that dead space of all the things that don't involve the alveoli. If we had alveoli that were dysfunctional or pathologic, we would have some alveolar dead space because we have alveoli that are not functioning appropriately. That's when you're going to see the physiologic dead space is not gonna equal anatomic dead space. Does that make a little bit more sense what I'm saying here? Kind of, sort of, maybe. Okay, I'll say it again. Alveolar ventilation. Ventilation of the alveoli. How much gas is getting to the alveoli every minute? Minute ventilation, how much gas is getting to the whole lung every minute? To calculate alveolar ventilation, you take the whole amount of gas that's getting to the lung, you subtract whatever dead space is not involved, and then you get how much gas is in those alveoli. You times it by how much you're breathing every minute, and you get that alveolar ventilation. In normal, healthy alveoli, all those alveoli are normal functioning. They're getting oxygen in, they're getting air in. So you count those as normal space. In pathologic alveoli, let's say alveoli that don't have enough surfactants, they're staying stuck together, or alveoli where there is emphysema, where they're not able to actually adequately perfuse and uptake gas, that also counts as alveolar dead space. And you would have to subtract those as well from your typical tidal volume to get alveolar ventilation. Does that make a little bit more sense? Maybe, okay. Yes, correct. There's less alveoli that are actually functional. If it's a functional, healthy alveoli, that's not subtracted as dead space. If it's not a functional alveoli, it's subtracted as dead space. Yes. Yep, and so if you think about that, you're gonna have less ventilation then to alveoli in all these conditions where you have more alveolar dead space. So the more alveolar dead space you have, the less, the less efficient and the less amount of ventilation you're getting to the alveoli, which makes sense. A lot of these conditions are having trouble actually perfusing, right? They're having trouble getting air from those lungs into the alveoli to then send it into the blood to get it perfused to the tissues, right? So that makes, makes logical sense, but looking at the numbers can be confusing. And again, you will not need to make these calculations. This is just if you really want to get into like partial pressures of stuff, you can go for it. They will not make you calculate this on NPLEX.
So what is our lung and chest wall's role then in ventilation? We're gonna talk a little bit about elastic recoil and compliance here. So elastic recoil, with elastic recoil really is two different pressures that are balancing each other. Essentially, it's meaning the lungs intrinsic nature to deflate with, with expiration, right? Expiration's passive. Our lungs want to deflate with expiration. So lungs have a tendency to collapse inward. That's what this picture is showing here. My little pointer. I'm all over the place. There we go. Okay. Lungs have a tendency to collapse inward on themselves. They're going in. That's lungs typical tendency, moving inward. That's why when we exhale, it's a passive process. Lungs are going inward, collapsing on themselves, pushing air up and out. The chest wall has an intrinsic ability to push outward though. And those pressures when balanced, they balance each other out and they prevent lung collapse. When those pressures are not balanced, that's what causes a pneumothorax or collapse wall. So if you have appropriate elastic recoil and appropriate balance of internal lung pressure and external chest wall pressure, you will not have a collapsed lung or pneumothorax. When those pressures get out of balance, that's when that pathology can occur. And it can happen many different reasons, right? Intrinsically, idiopathically, from a trauma or a force from infection or some other slight that's affecting those systems. So there's lots of things that can lead to lung collapse. But idiopathically, my brother, he had three um, pneumothorax, all idiopathic, and it was due to an imbalance of his lung pressure inward and his chest wall pressure outward. He's the typical tall, skinny, you know, athletic, maybe a little Marfanzi, we haven't decided, type. And so you can see here at functional residual capacity at FRC, the airway and alveolar pressures equal atmospheric pressure, which is referred to as PB or zero, that's atmospheric pressure, and intrapleural pressure, so, plural, so pressure in this intrapleural space, this is the intrapleural space here, will be negative. So in a normal lung, intrapleural pressure is negative, meaning our lungs are going to want to deflate, our chest wall is going to want to push out, our lungs don't collapse, our airway and our alveolar pressure equal atmospheric pressure. If intrapleural pressure becomes not negative, so it becomes closer to zero or positive, that can set us up for a lung collapse as well. So different ways of saying the same exact thing. An imbalance of lung pressure versus chest wall pressure or intrapural pressure not being negative, becoming more positive, either at neutral or positive. Let me see the little pop. Now what about compliance? Compliance is your change in lung volume for a change in pressure. So compliance is inversely proportional to wall stiffness. What that means is if you have an increase in compliance, it means your wall is less stiff. You have a decrease in wall stiffness. So if your lungs are able to adapt to different pressures, that means the walls in themselves are less stiff. If the lungs are less compliant, that means the walls are more stiff. So things like fibrosis or infiltrates like amyloidosis or sarcoidosis, things that are going to increase wall stiffness are going to decrease lung compliance. So again, with lung pathology, it's not why I, it's why I don't go through a bunch of these pathologies step by step for the, for the lungs, because if you understand some of these general terms, any condition that's going to cause infiltrate or fibrosis to the lungs is going to increase stiffness, which is going to decrease compliance. When you have decreased compliance, you're going to have a harder time filling lungs to full capacity. When you have a harder time filling lungs to full capacity, you're going to decrease you know, those, those different volume pressures, those volume curves and capacities that we saw at the beginning. You do that, that's going to decrease perfusion. You see how it kind of goes on and on and on. You don't need to memorize the different pathologies. You just need to know what part of physiology they're going to affect. Okay. That's my key for you. In compliance is also increased by surfactant. So any conditions where we have a low amount of surfactant, a lot of our congenital conditions, you're going to see less compliance. Which if you have less compliance, you've increased wall stiffness. You can go back the other way. Increased compliance means lung can fill up easier, more air, more oxygen. Decreased compliance, lung is more difficult to fill. That is the base. That's it for that one. Yes. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Increased compliance with emphysema. Yeah, so is emphysema a fibrotic condition? No. What happens with emphysema? The lungs are kind of ballooned and loosey-goosey, but you're not doing good perfusion, right? You're dealing with those alveolar areas that are having the dysfunction. You're having a harder time with your alveoli actually taking that oxygenation, being nice, plump alveoli, they're flattened, right? So less perfusion from those alveoli, less oxygen coming through into the blood, less carbon dioxide leaving through those alveolar tissues, which we're gonna get to ventilation perfusion here in a minute. But you'll see increased compliance, yes, because the body's trying to get more air. It's trying to make the lungs fill bigger and bigger and bigger because your body's wanting more oxygen but your actual alveolar perfusion isn't doing the job it needs to do. Yeah, absolutely. But sometimes you just gotta talk through these things, right? Like, it's like, what does the book say? I mean, USMLE is awesome, but they don't explain anything, right? They just give you like the down and dirty, nitty gritty stuff. And then it's like, what is this? I don't understand what this means. Yeah. I use USMLE a lot and I reference them often here, especially figures and, and equations but they don't do a great explanation of things. They expect you just to know stuff. I don't know anything. Okay. This is our next pulmonary system. Oh yeah, we're doing great. We might even be able to get to vascular conditions. So we're gonna get into a little bit more of tissue perfusion now, ventilation, gas exchange. So what's happening on that alveolar, blood, cellular level. So we went from big picture tissue, inspiration, expiration, to what those volumes look like, to now what the pressures are looking like, and now we're getting smaller, right? We keep getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And then we're gonna talk about control, a little bit about control. So carbon dioxide transport. CO2 is gonna enter your red blood cells from your tissue. You can see it here, tissue, red blood cell, it gets converted into three different forms. CO2 gets dissolved directly into your plasma, that's the smallest. It's gonna get converted into bicarb, that's by far the largest. And it's gonna get converted into this carbamino hemoglobin, which essentially just means it's bound to a protein, okay? So it's gonna get converted to a form that's bound to the protein. These are the three forms where it's transported to your lungs, carbon dioxide. Bicarb, like I said, is the most. It does this through this bicarb chloride transport on the membrane. So bicarb, we have this conversion, CO2 plus water, carbonic anhydrase, it's the enzyme. So I think this is like our middle point, I forget what that's called. And then bicarb plus hydrogen, and then bicarb goes out in exchange for chloride ion. So that's our bicarb process. If you just remember CO2 gets transported as bicarb by far as the most, common transport way of CO2, that's probably sufficient for n plus one. If you remember that carbonic anhydrase is your enzyme, bonus, okay? Um, then we have our carbonamino hemoglobin, which is our midway point. That's this little dude right here. It's getting bound to hemoglobin. It's not bound to the heme portion, it's bound to the end terminus of the globin. So it doesn't like to be bound to the heme like oxygen, and it likes hemoglobin that's deoxygenated. So this is gonna be your hemoglobin that doesn't have oxygen on it. That's what carbon dioxide is gonna wanna bind to. Makes sense. It's not really friends with oxygen. And then dissolved in the plasma. Direct dissolved is like less than 5%. So it's the least amount. Bicarb is our biggest buffer, so we do need bicarb. We need CO2 in the body to be our buffer system for our blood, so bicarb is important. It's why we have the most of it when we're doing CO2 transport. So again, some information here. So this is gas exchange at respiring tissues versus gas exchange at the lungs, at the alveoli. So this is CO2 coming into red blood cells versus CO2 leaving red blood cells, okay? Going into alveoli to be expired. So you can see here, it's very similar process, just in reverse. Here we're taking CO2 and making stuff. Here we're taking stuff and making CO2. Carbon dioxide transport, the oxygenation of hemoglobin promotes the dissociation of hydrogen from hemoglobin. 
that helps kick off CO2, the equilibrium is going to shift towards CO2 formation, which releases CO2 from RBCs. It's called the Haldane effect. I doubt they would test you on that specific word, but it's there in case you see it referenced in a book. Essentially, oxygen comes in, uh, redox reduction happens, redox reaction occurs, kicks off some hydrogen, and then it triggers the release of CO2. That's what this process is in the whole. So what does pulmonary circulation look like? So here again, some anatomy. We have our trachea coming down to our bronchus. We have here, let me get my little pen. So trachea to our bronchus on either side. This is obviously our heart. We have here our left pulmonary artery and our right pulmonary artery. We have our middle lobular bronchus here, that yellow portion. You can see then this would also be referred to as a middle lobular bronchus here. Upper, upper, lower, lower. So lower, middle, upper, upper, middle, lower. Okay, see how those work, the yellows? Then we have our heart veins here. It's not really helpful, I don't really care about that. Yeah, all the rest of it's heart. Main thing on this page, trachea, bronchus, upper, middle, lower, lobar bronchus. But overall, pulmonary circulation is a low resistance, high compliance system. Oxygen is going to diffuse slowly across the alveolar membranes. Carbon dioxide diffuses fast across those membranes. Pulmonary diffusion increases with increased area, larger differences between partial pressures, so increased need or demand, right? If there's more carbon dioxide than oxygen, it's going to it's going to increase whichever one we need more, right? So if we have more carbon dioxide in our system and we need more oxygen, then we're going to kick out more carbon dioxide in exchange for more R2. Since CO2, since carbon dioxide gets released or passed through quicker, it's much easier for us to get rid of it or gain it quickly than it is to actually get rid of or gain oxygen quickly. So we're likely to have a CO2 issue before an oxygen issue. Does that make sense? Because CO2 goes a lot faster through those membranes. It decreases diffusion, decreases with decreased area. That makes sense. Less area, less room for actual those ions to exchange. Less difference between partial pressures. If the pressures are almost equal, equal amounts of oxygen and CO2, there's less need or demand to go one way or the other. And a thicker alveolar wall. So as the alveolar wall gets thickened or fibrosed or something happens or less compliant, right? Um, or more compliant, more thick, I think thickness, decreases compliance, yeah, so decreased compliance, increased thickness, we're going to have a harder time with that perfusion piece at the alveolar wall. And then we also have to pay attention to what's happening down the chain of blood vessels, the pulmonary vascular resistance. So our pulmonary vascular resistance, so that is this equation here, pulmonary vascular resistance, it's PVR, it's our pressure in the pulmonary arteries minus the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure over cardiac output. So cardiac output's involved, so the heart is going to directly relate to pulmonary vascular resistance, which makes sense. That's why heart conditions can contribute to lung conditions and vice versa. So pulmonary vascular resistance can decrease with increased cardiac output, decreased arterial resistance, decreased blood viscosity or stickiness, decreased vessel length or decrease or increased vessel radius, vasodilation, right? Less resistance if the veins are larger, wider, right? Blood can flow easier if the veins are dilated. If the vessels are if the vessels are decreased, if the blood viscosity, if the blood viscosity is less sticky, it's going to be easier for stuff to flow through. If there's less arterial resistance, it's easier for stuff to flow through. Increased cardiac output means more blood's being pushed into the system, which means that Vascular resistance is going to go down because there's more blood being pushed through faster by our heart, right? Because this is pulmonary vascular resistance, not arterial or cardiac vascular resistance. And then other stuff over here, we can see that it's increased by hypoxia or hypercarbia or acidosis, decreased by hypocarbia, alkalosis. So I would say of these major factors, knowing 
what acidosis and alkalosis will do to breathing would be probably your biggest, your most important thing for the box. So if you have acidosis in the blood, if your blood is acidic, what is your body going to want to do to combat that? What do you want to have more around as a buffer to make the blood more basic? Bicarb, great. And bicarb is a byproduct of what? Carbon dioxide, great. So you're going to want more carbon dioxide or less carbon dioxide in your system to make your blood more basic. More carbon dioxide, great. What about alkalosis? Inverse, exactly. Everything we just said, but the opposite. So how do you get more carbon dioxide into the system? Through breathing. Huh? Breathe less, OK. And how do you get more oxygen into your system? Breathe more, right? Great. Breathe more. You're increasing your breath. You're trying to take more breaths in. Breathe less, less breaths out. Good. More oxygen so it's at the baseline level, right? Baseline level, that's what we're looking at. Yes. Yep. Correct. Absolutely. So increased perfusion, right? Increased oxygenation will help treat our alkalosis. But hyperventilation, breathing too fast, is actually going to increase our carbon dioxide because we're not actually doing adequate tissue perfusion or exchange of oxygen carbon dioxide. We're going to increase our CO2 level. So we would make our alkaline blood more alkaline if you hyperventilated. That's why if someone's in acidosis, you're going to see them hyperventilate. You're going to see tachypnea and tachycardia with someone who's in acidosis. Alkalosis, you might actually see slower breathing, slower deep belly breaths. And someone who's alkalosis. You could see indirect effects with blood pressure, absolutely, because you're having an effect on oxygenation and carbon dioxide, which is going to affect perfusion of the heart tissue, which then can affect the absolutely blood pressure. Because we see here cardiac output is directly related. And cardiac output, remember, has heart rate as a part of it and how effectively the heart is pumping, how, how strong the heart contraction is. Great. All these connections. And then there's, of course, our sympathetic nervous system, which we'll get to, which has an effect. But first, I want to talk a little bit about ventilation perfusion ratio. Uh, this comes into play on a couple different cardiovascular and pulmonary conditions. So what ventilation perfusion ratio just means is ventilation, how we breathe in and out, right, inspiration, expiration, typically matches perfusion, the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange at our tissues. Typically, in a healthy system, ideally, they equal each other. They equal one. V over Q equals one per minute during adequate gas exchange. This can change based off of where we are in the lungs, though. So each portion of the lungs has a different zone. So zone one, which is the apex of the lungs, so up top here, the VQ ratio is increased. So you'll see ventilation and perfusion up top are decreased, but ventilation's decreased less than perfusion is. Up at the top of your lungs, there's much, much less perfusion than there is ventilation, although both are lowered. Therefore, your VQ ratio is going to increase. Okay, I'll say it again. Both ventilation and perfusion are lower in zone one of the lung up top, but Perfusion decreases more than ventilation, therefore your ratio goes up. That's V over Q. Okay? What you could think about here, your most common condition that this would affect, things like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis likes to hang out in that apex, that upper area of the lung, where there's less ventilation, but less perfusion. Part of that is because it can grow its nice little sacs here without being hit by the immune system that often there's less blood flow, less tissue, blood exchange, less immune products that are coming through the apex of the lung than maybe at the base of the lung. So TV likes to hang out up top, tuberculosis. In the middle of the lung, zone two, VQ ratio equals one. So that's where things are pretty much at baseline, is in the middle of the lung, middle lobe, or kind of middle region of the lung tissue. And then zone three, the base of the lung, the VQ ratio is decreased. So both ventilation and perfusion are increased at the base of the lung, 
a lot more surface area at the base of the lung. So there's more ventilation, more area for air to get to, and more perfusion, more blood vessels that are flowing through. But perfusion increases more than ventilation because there's only so much your lungs can ventilate, right? There's only so much space but there's tons and tons of blood flow and perfusion happening at that base of the lung. So because of that, the VQ ratio goes down in zone three. Okay, when this might be important, uh, I would say when talking about immune conditions of the lung, potentially COPD, or they could just ask you a ventilation perfusion ratio question directly. So understanding kind of these three different zones, what it means by ventilation and perfusion, and know that ventilation and perfusion are going to decrease in zone one and increase in zone three, but perfusion increases more in zone three, ventilation increases more in zone one. So that's what's changing your ratios. That's why I like this picture. I think this picture probably summarizes it the easiest of anything I've seen. So gas exchange equation, again, I don't think they're gonna make you calculate things. I've never seen that before, but I want you to understand the theories behind these gas exchange kind of reasonings and processes. So gases move passively across these membranes, right? They're going down their diffusion gradient. You'll see these different terms. So PaO2 is alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. PiO2 is the oxygen partial pressure of oxygen in inspired air. PaCO2 is your arterial carbon dioxide, your partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And RQ is this respiratory quotient, which is the CO2 produced over the oxygen consumed. So this is your alveolar gas exchange equation. It's essentially the partial pressure of your alveolar oxygen equals the partial pressure of oxygen in the air you're breathing minus carbon dioxide in your arterial system over a respiratory quotient, which is how much CO2 is produced versus oxygen consumed. You could think about this in a simpler way of just saying, is your balance of how much oxygen carbon dioxide is in your systemic circulatory system compared to how much oxygen is coming in, to how much oxygen demand I need to keep that balance. Okay, that's how I would look at this. Your alveolar gas exchange is affected by kind of three main things, surface area, which we've talked about, partial pressures, so the concentration themselves of the gases, and that matching ventilation perfusion ratio, so making sure it's hitting the ratio that it should. I don't know why it's all coming up again. Wonderful. So good, we had to show it twice. Okay. So now here are some controls. I wanted to spend a little time talking about the controls of the pulmonary system. So there's several different areas that kind of help control the whole respiratory system, some that are in the central nervous system, and some that are about a part of the autonomic nervous system. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both. We're gonna do a little neuroanatomy, a little bit, not a lot. So first, carbon dioxide and oxygen status in the body, by far the biggest controller of breathing, right? What is the concentration of CO2? What is the concentration of oxygen? Which one do you need depending on your state? This is detected by chemoreceptors on the surface of both your medulla and your brain. There's also peripheral ones as well. But the ones in the medulla will detect pH changes in your cerebrospinal fluid. So they're detecting is the pH more acidosis, more acidic? Or is it more alkaline, right? Is it lower or higher? More acidic or more alkaline? Peripherally, chemoreceptors on your carotid and aortic bodies are gonna detect, detect not only pH, but CO2 and oxygen changes in the blood. So the chemoreceptors peripherally can detect a little bit more. And they're gonna send this signal peripherally through the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves to the brain directly, right? So they're gonna send up those cranial nerves. Ventilation, respiratory rate will increase with exercise due to increased need for oxygen. It's just an aside here, I just want you to keep that in mind. Anytime we have an increased need in oxygen from whatever state, we're gonna up our ventilation. If you move into hyperventilation, you're not increasing oxygenation anymore, then you're increasing carbon dioxide, right? So that's a fine line. So then there's some control factors that happen from the CNS down. So that was to the CNS, right? Chemoreceptors up. Now we're going from the CNS, the central nervous system down. 
So there's signals that once we get those chemoreceptor signals, they're fed up to the respiratory center in the brain, which is located in that medulla, that medullary area. There's inspiratory and expiratory neurons in that area. How wonderful. Expiratory neurons are only activated, though, for deep expiration. Why? What's expiration at baseline? Passive. So the only time we really need to actually change expiration is if we need to do active expiration, right? So expiration, expiratory neurons are only activated for deep expiration. Inspiratory neurons, though, could be activated anytime because we inspiration is an active process. We use muscles to breathe in, and then we breathe out passively. So our medulla has three respiratory control centers. There's a dorsal and a ventral group. The dorsal group controls inspiration. The ventral group controls expiration. And then there's this weird pre-Botzinger complex, which is almost like you think of your SA node of your heart. It's your intrinsic rhythm generator of your lungs. So how your SA node in your heart does that intrinsic lung or heart generation of rhythm, your pre-Botzinger complex is known to do the same thing, though, for your lung system. Will they get that complex? Probably not, but I want you to know it exists. You see pre-Botzinger? Think of SA node. Okay. So these are your three medullary, medulla, respiratory control centers. They will interact at the pons. So medulla, pons, right? So we have our medulla here, and we have our pons here. So we have our medulla, woo, here's there, and our pons up here. Yay, brain anatomy. And at the pons, they're going to interact at this pneumotaxic and apneustic center. You could also just refer to it as your pontine, pons, pontine respiratory group. These specific things are going to either inhibit, pneumotaxic inhibits, or stimulates, apneustic stimulates, inspiration. So pons affects the inspiration. It's either going to inhibit or stimulate it. Medulla is going to affect inspiration or expiration or the automatic, automatic control of the lungs. Where I could see this coming up is maybe asking what portions of the brain control the respiratory center. So no, wanting to know medulla and pons. I don't know if they would go as specific as asking like dorsal respiratory, ventral respiratory, but they, I could see them asking questions about um, understanding that expiration is typically passive. So asking questions surrounding that. So when would you need to activate the respiratory center in the brain? for active in expiration, so it might be because of a state that would cause active expiration. So those are our chemoreceptors and our central nervous system response. We also have mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are assessing the mechanical response. Chemoreceptors, chemical, mechanoreceptors, mechanical. Okay, we can remember that. They're in the lungs and they assess it via the vagus nerve. So that's the nerve that's gonna innervate. These are typically stretch receptors. They're activated when lungs are excessively inflated. So a condition like emphysema, where you have increased compliance and the lungs are ballooning up, or if you're taking really, really deep breaths, that's going to activate your mechanoreceptors in your lungs because you're going to have that stretch receptor that's going to send a signal via the vagus nerve. That is going to trigger our inspiration reflex, which stops inspiration and prolongs expiration. The reason? Because it thinks the lungs are overinflated. So that's why you can't just breathe in for forever, right? At some point, there's a stopping point. Your lungs aren't just going to pop. That's because they feel that stretch reflex, sends a signal of the vagus nerve, tells your brain to stop inspiration and to promote long expiration to breathe out that excess air that you just breathed in. Pretty cool. The fibers from that vagus nerve synapse in the cervical and thoracic spine. They synapse with motor neurons then. Specifically, you have phrenic nerves that control your diaphragm and intercostal nerves that control the intercostal muscles. So this is how you can get your accessory muscles activated. Mechanoreceptors, stretch, signal up through vagus, high brain, signal down through central and thoracic nerves, synapse with phrenic or intercostal nerves, stimulate diaphragm or intercostal muscles. That's the process up and down. Why though then, is pain, emotion, and 
why do we have a voluntary control, right? We can do, we did deep belly breaths yesterday. You know, why do we, why are we able to do this? Why does stress or fear or pain cause a change in breathing? Well, our limbic and hypothalamus system, when in doubt, if there's pain or emotion involved, blame the limbic or hypothalamus, okay? So limbic and hypothalamus are gonna send information to that same respiratory center in the medulla and pons. So they get involved, and that's why our pain and emotional state can change our breathing. And that's probably the most in-depth you'll need to know for this exam. You're not gonna need to know the exact limbic or hypothalamic pathways. But know that the limbic and hypothalamic system are going to be controlling that pain or emotion response. They're going to send that single that input to the medulla or the pons where the respiratory center is located. Your voluntary control comes from a different center, the primary motor cortex, which communicates directly to your spinal cord and it bypasses your brain stem. So when, when you have voluntary control of your breathing, when you're focusing on deep belly breaths or you're meditating, that is using your primary motor cortex, you're communicating directly with your spinal cord, you're not going through that respiratory center. That's how we can actually train it to become more efficient. So people who are singers, opera singers, swimmers, divers, anything where you're having to focus on your holding your breath or using your breath in a specific way, it can be trained. And that's because we're using that primary motor cortex instead of those central nervous autonomic systems. Pretty cool. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Here, let me go back to that if you don't mind. Oh, too far. Got too excited. There you go. So medulla, dorsal respiratory group controls inspiration, can speed it up or slow it down. It's just affecting inspiration itself, your actual breathing in process. Ventral respiratory group, also in the medulla, controls expiration, active expiration. Free Botson air, intrinsic rhythm generator in the medulla. Hans has the pneumotaxic center, which is going to inhibit, only inhibit inspiration. And at the pons, you have the apneustic center, which is only going to stimulate inspiration. So both things at the pons are only affecting inspiration, much like the dorsal respiratory group. Dorsal respiratory group could stimulate or inhibit inspiration. The pons is specifically controlling one side or another. So it's some additional control we have over that process. Yeah, does that help? Okay, great. Awesome. I do not want to keep them. Oh, well, whoops, I did. All right, lung. Woo. Okay. What I want to do, I'm going to show you this here. Dr. Megan Taylor, she created this fabulous little table. And we're going to work on filling out this table over the next couple of days. So this is a preview of what's to come. I am going to bring in some drawings and poster boards. We're going to map some things out too, because I feel like mapping out biochemical processes is much easier. But if you know the things that are in this table, so this is something you could start filling out now. Now make sure it's on the main part of your Moodle page. If you know the main components of the table, so the tissues that these pathways occur in, there are cellular compartments, the substrates used, the enzyme that's mainly the control enzyme, the products, the regulators, the intermediates, the energy, if you know this stuff, you're probably gonna be fine from the majority of your biochemical questions on the NPLEX. So this is the big, this is the big bread and butter. Now, will there be questions that aren't on this table? 100%, will the majority be on this table? Yes. So we're, that's gonna be our goal. If we know this, we know biochemistry. Dr. D would be so proud. Okay. Does he still wear his garb for exams? Oh, good. I forget what we gave him. We gave him something good. Okay. It's on Moodle, but it's kind of hidden. So I'm gonna post it under um, our day two. So it'll be under there um, once I leave today. And I tried to upload all of our recordings from yesterday, but they were too big. So I'm gonna have to break them into smaller files. So I'm working on that. I'll, I'll get that done by Thursday, which is our next class. So we don't meet tomorrow. Thursday, we'll be meeting upstairs in 310. It's the only day we meet in 310. I don't know. Um, and then Friday, we'll be back in here in the dungeon the rest of the time, okay? Tomorrow, what I would suggest doing is I would review cardio and pulm. 
I would work on filling out this table. And then I would do a preview of endo and gastro because we're going to go through endo and gastro on Thursday, Friday. So review cardio and palm, work on the table, preview, maybe just watch like a video or something on endo and gastro. We're going to delve into endocrine on Thursday. We're going to go through all the hormones. So we'll do, we'll just, we're going to do it. Okay. Get them done. All the major hormone pathways of endo, endocrine system. Friday, we're going to deep dive into the major kind of physiologic and pathologic places of the gut. And then we'll be done with that. Sounds good? Okay, awesome. Um, how are we doing with brain power? Do you have time for a few more things? Or are you done for the day? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I have a vote for end. I have a vote for end or keep going. Keep going. Okay, you go ahead and leave if you want to or pass out. It's fine. I'm going to push on. I think I can run through vascular by the time we're done, which will be the last thing we have for cardio and for palm for this section. So these are our vascular PowerPoints. This is one H and one I. And the reason I have these is just because they're, they're kind of overlap a bit. And so I wanted to provide a little bit of differentiation for you on some of these conditions. So first we're gonna just do um, aneurysm, aortic dissection, arterio and atherosclerosis, and a little bit on familial hypercholesterolemia. This is gonna go by relatively fast. So aneurysm, we have thoracic aortic aneurysm and abdominal aortic aneurysm. So essentially an aneurysm is just your dilatation or dilation of an aorta. Your risk factors are anything that can really increase pressure or anything that can change that output flow into specifically the aortic valve or the aorta itself. So hypertension, bicuspid aortic valve, I told you when in doubt, that's probably your most common congenital to cause stuff to happen in the cardiovascular system. Connective tissue diseases like Marfan's because of decreased compliance. Tertiary syphilis, similar reason, you start seeing decreased compliance and effects on the actual sympathetic nervous system. So you start seeing more vasoconstriction when you get to that State. Pathogenesis is really just your aortic root is just dilating and it could lead to valve regurgitation. It could also lead to um, dissection or rupture. Uh, as a stable state, thoracic aortic aneurysm is more risky than abdominal, but when they're stable, they often are just going to watch and wait. So you wouldn't necessarily notice any symptoms unless of abdominal aorta, you can feel it, right? You might have pain. If you're having pain, it's a sign probably of leakage, dissection, or rupture. So if you're having symptoms with these, it's probably moving towards a complication. It's probably not stable. So abdominal aortic aneurysm, same, same. When you have a few other risk factors, though, specifically for the abdominal, that's important to note, tobacco and male gender, they seem to be associated. So the picture I tend to paint is an older male, gentle, male gendered gentleman who smoked tobacco his whole life, whose father had an abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's my person that I come into my brain when I think about this classic presentation of AAA. Transmural means all three layers are affected. Um, it doesn't have to be transmural, but by far if it is transmural, it's going to be not the best, probably the worst. It's more likely to lead to dissection or rupture. And you start seeing inflammation and extracellular matrix degeneration, so breakdown of those cellular structures. And again, same symptoms. So dissection, this is where it starts to get important. This is the complication of an aneurysm. So aneurysm's main complications is dissection or rupture. So again, you can start seeing, you can actually see a dissection here. So you have your aorta, you have blood in the wall of the actual artery and blood in your artery. So you have leakage through that artery wall in between those tissue layers. If it gets all the way through, then you have rupture, which is surgery or death often. By the time it ruptures, you, if you aren't in a hospital, you're often going to die. Um, so it's typically a longitudinal tear. So moving along the same route as the aorta, it's typically not horizontal. Uh, there's two types, type A or type B. Uh, I don't think that you'll necessarily need to know the difference. Just know there are two types and they depend on location. So type A is proximal, type B is more distal. And your risk factors are going to be the same as the risk factors for uh, actual aneurysm. They just has developed into a dissection. 
Your main characteristic is you hear tearing, like tearing pain, either chest pain or stomach pain, but it feels like a tear. Patients will describe it as a tear. And I've seen that clinically to be true. Uh, unequal blood pressure, mediastinal widening, you could see, I guess, but typically a, the tearing pain and unequal blood pressure are like the two kind of cardinal signs that I've seen. And then ischemia, rupture, and death. That's really your complication. So this is one of those big bads. You could see some regurgitation or cardiac tamponade if you live through it, but this is typically a surgical procedure. Okay, short and sweet, done. Arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, arterial wall thickening, loss of elasticity. That's what this means. So versus atherosclerosis, that plaque buildup, right? So arteriosclerosis, hardening, thickening of the wall, loss of elasticity and compliance, atherosclerosis, add a plaque on board. So this typically affects small arteries and arterioles. Highland sets that thickening of the vessel wall, secondary to kind of plasma protein leaks into endothelium. It happens more and more in hypertension and diabetes. So think sticky blood vessels with the sugar and less compliant blood vessels with high blood pressure. You also see hyperplastic type. This is more of an onion skin type in severe hypertension. It almost looks like um, you have concentric layers in someone who has a hyperplastic type of arteriosclerosis. You would only see these types if you were doing a sliced look under a microscope. So typically post-mortem, unless you do some type of like bypass, then you might remove the artery or arterial and see. So atherosclerosis, on the other hand, and you can have both or either, atherosclerosis is very common. It's typically affecting more elastic arteries, large and medium-sized muscle arteries, versus arteriosclerosis is those tinier arterioles and smaller arteries, right? And atherosclerosis is a form of arterial sclerosis. So these are often, I'm saying it slow and a lot, so I don't mix words because they're often confused on the test. So the pathogenesis of our atherosclerosis is pretty step-by-step. Step. So I have the picture version here, which you could kind of follow along. And I'm gonna read the words just so that you could also have text to accompany the picture. So you start with a buildup of a cholesterol plaque in your tunica intima. So we see here, we're in this intima here. So you have a buildup of a cholesterol plaque. The location, um, if you wanted to memorize a location, you could think about a copycat named Willis as your common locations for atherosclerosis. So abdominal aorta is the A, coronary artery is the copycat, or it's like the C, popliteal artery is the P, carotid artery is the C, and then named Willis, your circle of Willis. So these would be your common areas where you'd see atherosclerosis in order of occurrence. So abdominal aorta is most common, then your coronaries, then your popliteal, then your carotids, then in your brain. And inflammation is really key for this process to occur. So it's really at the baseline of what it is. It's an inflammatory process. You have endothelial cells that kind of go run amok. So you'll see macrophages being in, recruited in, and you see LDL accumulation will occur actually within those macrophages themselves which then become foam cells. You can see these foam cells form, right? So macrophages are there because they see inflammation. There's this inflammation's there, I'm gonna eat up the cholesterol. They actually do, they mop up some of the LDL, but then they turn into foam cells. They essentially drown themselves in fat. That's what you can think of as these macroph macro macrophages. Once you have foam cell formation, those are eventually gonna turn into those fatty streaks that you can see on the actual lining of the arteries. And then once the fatty streaks are there, you'll see some smooth muscle cell migration that's occurring because the body is trying to fix this process. It's not understanding why all of a sudden we're seeing these fatty changes on the surface of our blood vessels. From there, there's proliferation and ECM, extracellular membrane deposition. So again, we're trying to heal the tissue. We're trying to create a nice smooth pathway. So we keep adding stuff on top of it. Yikes, not the best process. But that's what we do in inflammation. Then that forms this fibrous plaque, which then eventually becomes a complex atherosclerotic lesion. Over time, those become hardened, and that's calcification. So at baseline, what is this process? Inflammation in the body. It involves macrophages, 
you get foam cells and fatty streaks, which then form into a plaque. So typically, it's not going to be it's not going to have symptoms until it does. Angina and claudication are your first typical signs that you'll see. Uh, risk factors are all kind of your risk factors for heart disease. Um, so pretty the common ones that we've talked about again postmenopausal status being the most interesting. Uh, just me, it involves hormones. Uh, complications the CAD and MIs. And that's really it with atherosclerosis. It's really your setup for all of those you know coronary artery disease, heart attacks hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Ischemic heart disease, chronic ischemic heart disease, right? It sets us up for all those conditions. Now, on the side on familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is different than hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia, right? Those are conditions that, you know, all of these are conditions of excessive cholesterol, but familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic disease. And so it's a receptor disease from a mutation in a gene that encodes for the receptor for LDL. And LDL is bad cholesterol, right? So we have loss of feedback control then, which leads to increased cholesterol levels. This leads to premature atherosclerosis and increased risk of MI. So essentially what we have is we have a receptor disease the receptor that encodes for LDL, to bind LDL, to take it up and to break it down or to use it for something else is broken. Since we can't remove as much LDL from the system, we end up having loss of that feedback control. Therefore, we continue to have increased cholesterol levels because the body doesn't recognize that cholesterol is present because those receptors aren't being adequately used or created. From there, we have buildup of plaques prematurely increased risk of MI. These are people who are young, healthy, who have super high cholesterol. And typically it's managed medication wise, but we do support it lots of ways. All right, last one, people, we can do it. We're almost there. I believe in you. Okay. The rest of the vascular stuff, so these are kind of the randoms, the randoms of the heart. So giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, these affect branches of your carotid artery. Uh, risk factors, they actually is more common in females. Elderly, polymyalgia, rheumatica, some random stuff. Clinical characteristics of one-sided, that's a UL, headache, HA, temporal artery tenderness, and jaw claudication. Complications, blindness, not so great due to ischemia and the optic nerve. Pathogenesis, it's essentially inflammation right at that spot. You can see increased CSR, you can see some increased cytokine formations, but you're looking at an inflammatory process affecting that specific artery. Peripheral artery disease, essentially insufficient tissue perfusion. It's gonna occur all over the place. You typically see signs and symptoms in your lower extremities. Narrow arteries reduce blood flow to the arms and legs. This can be from fat, sugar, anything that's going to clog or block those little tiny capillaries and arterioles. Your typicals for risk factors, complications, limb ischemia, stroke, heart attack. Your clinical characteristics, probably the most interesting ones is hair loss in lower legs. Loss of peripheral pulses, ulcerations that don't heal, erectile dysfunction. Because um, think about it, any peripheral artery, right? This can occur. Modeling of the lower extremities, change of color. Okay. Varicose veins. I know I'm flying through, but I want to get it done for y'all. Abnormally dilated, torturous, superficial veins. Typically, it's over time, it's due to increased intraluminal pressure and loss of that vessel wall support. So you can think of the vessel wall just doesn't have as much supportive muscle tissue around it anymore. This is always occurring or most of the time occurring in superficial veins. So it's actually not going to increase your risk for a DVT. DVT is deep vein thrombosis. So this is probably the easiest time when they try to catch you is they'll try to get you to say that a varicose vein is going to lead to a DVT. That is not true because a DVT is deep vein thrombosis, so deep veins, versus varicose is your superficial veins. Now, could it happen if you had some venous stasis as well? 
then that's a different story, right? We have Venus stasis and pooling, that could change things. But varicose veins itself, no, not a risk factor for DVT. Increased venous pressure, venous stasis, pedal edema, stasis dermatitis, ulcerations are your complications. Risk factor, anything that's causing stagnation. So these are some things you could think about. The female gender piece, I probably maybe estrogen, um, a piece there, I'm not sure. But yeah, that's just what it said. I don't like it, but it's fine. All right, vasculitis, vessel wall inflammation. There's tons of types of vasculitis, so I made a chart. Don't memorize this chart at all. Don't do it. Just know that there's lots of different types of vasculitis. You can break them down by location and size of vessel. So large vessel vasculitis, we already talked about one, giant cell temporal arteritis. There's medium vessel, small vessel, right? Depending on where it's affecting you. Essentially, all of these are inflammation of a vessel. There are infectious causes. There's non-infectious causes. One that's important on this list, or a few that are important on this list that I want to point out, polyarteritis nodosa. This is necrotizing inflammation that involves renal arteries and spares pulmonary vessels. This one could come up on your test, so just keep that. This might be like a good, just a little quick memorization. A medium vessel vasculitis, polyarteritis nodosa, necrotizing kidney. Okay, that's, that's what I'd put together for that. Another one that could come up would be Wegener's granulomatosis. We'll probably mention Wegener's a little bit later, um, but it's a small vessel vasculitis that can involve the respiratory tract and it's necrotizing as well. So this one does not spare pulmonary vessels. Polyarteritis nodosa does not affect pulmonary vessels, affects kidney. Wegener granulomatosis is involved, it's necrotizing as well small vessels, not medium, and doesn't spare the respiratory tract will affect the respiratory tract. So there's a big difference between these two. Schurg-Strauss is the same as Wegener's, but you'll see asthma and blood eosinophilia. So you'll actually see eosinophils in the blood. We're moving on for vasculitis. There will be one vasculitis we pop back to later. Thrombosis, DVT, deep vein thrombosis. If you want a mnemonic for etiology, I've got you one. Thrombosis, it has a bunch of different etiologies for you if that's helpful for you to learn. Essentially, it's just going to be though your deep blood clot, a blood clot within a deep vein. Typically, it's going to affect your proximal lower extremity veins like your iliac, your femoral, or your popliteal. Characteristics of swelling, redness, warmth, and pain. And then this is important is Virchow's triad, which is SHE, that's your acronym. Stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. So Virchow's triad is your big etiolo etiology for DVT. Virchow's triad is stasis, which can happen from anything where you're stagnant, right? Post-op, flying on a plane, long travels. Hypercoagulability, so this could be if you're in a hypercoagulable state or maybe pregnancy or taking OCPs or hormone replacement therapy, anything that can make your blood more coagulable. Endothelial damage. So anything that's exposing that collagen is going to trigger the clotting cascade. So if you're having damage to your blood vessels from atherosclerosis or diabetes, long-term uncomplicated diabetes, you have all those, that sugar, those sticky blood vessels, then you get a plaque and it tears. That's going to cause exposed collagen, exposed endothelial damage, which then can trigger a clot. That's Virchow's triad. DVT, risk factor complication for PE, pulmonary embolism, does not always develop into a pulmonary embolism, right? So not, always, not an always, but a, a could, okay? There's several different types of pulmonary embolisms. The acronym is FAT-BAT. So fat, air, thrombus, bacteria, amniotic fluid, and tumor are your risk are your types of pulmonary embolism. We think most commonly of like an air embolus when we're doing IVs or blood draws. That's when we get really nervous about air embolus. Risk factors also, they have a thrombus there as risk factors. But essentially it's obstruction of the pulmonary artery or any of its branches from some type of emboli or embolotic event. Your affected alveoli are ventilated, meaning they get air to them, but they don't get perfusion. 
So you have a VQ mismatch. So that's when that VQ piece comes into play. So again, you have obstruction of blood flow. So you're able to get air to the alveoli, but you don't have any blood flow to the alveoli. So you get ventilation, but no perfusion, no exchange of the goods. And typically you see this as like sudden shortness of breath with pain, with inspiration, tachypnea, tachycardia. Obviously complications could be sudden death if you aren't effectively treated. Renauds, primary and secondary. Primary is idiopathic. That's what I want you to know. Secondary, typically more associated with some type of connective tissue issue. We often think about lupus as potentially being an associated condition or Crest syndrome. Complications we could see is digital ulceration. I'd say by far when I've seen this on the exam, I've seen it associated with SLE, lupus, or a mixed connective tissue disease. Essentially, it's just decreased blood flow to your skin due to arteriolar small vessel vasospasms in response to typically cold or stress. And you'll see that change in color, that white or blue, that then goes to red. Thrombo, we're almost there. Thromboangitis obliterans, Bruegger's disease. This one I put on its own because it's important and I feel like it's been on every NPLEX since the beginning of time. They love this condition. It's vascular insufficiency. It's typically segmental, thrombosing, acute, and chronic inflammation of medium and small size arteries, so tibial and radial. This is cigarette smokers, long-term cigarette smokers, and it typically occurs in younger people. So when you think of thromboangitis obliterans, think of a vascular insufficiency associated with tobacco use. And the pathogenesis there is still a little bit of an unknown, so I don't know if they'll ask you about it directly, but it is suspected to be from endothelial cell toxicity by tobacco itself or potentially an immune response to those agents. So some type of cross-reactivity, if not direct reactivity. And chronically, you can see ulcerations. That's it. All right, we did it. You've successfully made it through pulmonary and cardio and your first practice exam ever, or maybe not ever. Hello, folks. Thank you. OK.